So welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you for this amazing week of classes all about the civil rights movement. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And this week's classes are some of our favorite topics to talk about and to teach. But we wanna be really clear and transparent when we talk about these topics. The civil rights movement and the civil rights struggle for freedom in America is a topic that goes from the beginning all the way to present day. So there is so much that we're gonna dive through during this class today. What was the exact civil rights movement? How can we only really focus on the 40s, 50s and 60s? What makes that period significant? But what are all the other amazing stories of resistance, of struggle and of change African-Americans have made in America to make America great and better and other people in America have done to move freedom forward and how have we changed the constitution while doing that? So a lot to go through. So we're really gonna spark your interest with this, but we will follow up with tons of resources on this. We wanna open a doorway so you can look at the whole, time, the whole civil rights movement and civil rights struggle, but really understand that we're just gonna to touch a little bit of the next half hour. To do this, thank goodness, I'm not by myself. I'm with one of our top scholars at the Constitution Center. His name is Tom Donnelly. Tom, would you like to say hello to all of our students? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Can't wait to get started. So, Tom, thinking about the civil rights movement and kind of the big idea that our students should take away, what is kind of a key learning goal you want them to think of every time they dive into understanding civil rights in, in America? That in a lot of ways, it is the story of America, that the battle for equality, the battle for civil rights begins with the declaration and shortly thereafter with early abolitionists already calling for the end of slavery through to, you know, the, a lot of the 1800s with many African Americans and their white allies pushing to abolish slavery and to lay claim to equal citizenship to African Americans to re to civil war and reconstruction and then all the way on until we get to the civil rights movement that we study most in the 40s, 50s and 60s. But more than anything, all of these pushes are an attempt to get America to live up to its founding ideals, its commitment to liberty and equality. So yeah, so I, and I love that one of our professors who's joining us on Friday talks about that this, we shouldn't think of it as the civil rights movement. We should think of this as the, the push and balance and achieving freedom in America. It's the freedom movement, it's the freedom struggle. And I was like, oh, I love that because it really does wrap our whole history into it. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do today is we wanted people to understand the people behind the, this great movement and the timeline. It's a longer timeline than we usually are taught and there's a lot more people. So we thought we'd start with meeting the organizations that really led the charge of the 1950s and 60s civil rights movement. So let's begin with the NAACP and some of the people we should learn from that organization. So the NAACP of these groups is the oldest. I mean, it, it's founded in 1909 so it gives you a sense that even this, this wave of the civil rights movement that's leading, you know, eventually towards Brown, towards the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the, one of the key organizations is all the way there from 1909. And so who are some of these key figures? Well, we see here three of the key founders, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Mary White Ovington, and uh, Moorfield Story. And so W.E.B. Du Bois may be the most familiar of these three. He was the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard. He wrote, he had very influential scholarship on Reconstruction, getting Americans way before, you know, the late 20th century to begin to see Reconstruction as a time where African Americans really fought for freedom and equality and achieved it for a period. And so we have W.E.B. Du Bois. We have Mary White Ovington. I just want to quickly uh, get both of those in there too. Sorry. Mary White Ovington, she was a suffragist, a journalist, one of the co-founders of the NAACP. And Moorfield Story was a prominent lawyer at the time from Boston and the founding president of the organization. And again, the NAACP most famous for the legal strategy and the push towards Brown, but did much more than that too. Got it. And then we have the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Sure, so the, this is in many ways, the, maybe the most famous of these organizations. You see it's associated with Dr. King uh, most prominently. It was founded in 1957, but around him were a, a range of really, really amazing people. So we see Ralph Abernathy and Fred Shuttlesworth are both prominent ministers. Uh, Shuttlesworth is in, uh, uh, is in uh, uh, Montgomery, uh, Abernathy in Birmingham, but all of them uh, working together to uh, push for nonviolent direct action. We see Bayard Rustin there on the bottom right, who was one of the really 
He, in many ways, was Dr. King's teacher of how to do nonviolent direct action, which we'll talk about um, as we get into the lecture. And Ella Baker is this amazing figure in the civil rights movement, prominent for five decades, involved with the NAACP, with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, later with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She's involved with all of these key, key figures working with Dr. King, Thurgood Marshall, A. Philip Randolph, but then a teacher to the next generation, Diane Nash, John Lewis, et cetera. So really this amazing figure who's pushing throughout to say the civil rights movement, it can't be top down and it can't just be all men leading it. We need men and women working together to realize the promise of freedom and equality. So one question that came in from the students in, um, let me make sure I'm getting the name of the class right. Um, Eckler class, um, who ran the civil rights movement? And I love that question because so many times, I, I mean, I remember it was always Martin Luther King ran the civil rights movement and it was like one group, one leader and one movement. And then I've been, you know, as I, you know, read more and learn more and Professor Jeffries taught us this one, that you have to think of the civil rights movement like stars in the sky, that it is people in America have always fought and resisted and pushed for more rights in civil rights, especially African-Americans. And we see them as stars twinkling in the sky. And then during the civil rights movement, some stars are shining brighter than others, but these organizations are the connecting dots between the stars and that's what makes our constellation. And that's what really rises to this moment that yes, Martin Luther King Jr. was a huge leader and an amazing, um, they were, the King Center did a performance on Monday for Martin Luther King Day. And what they said was he had the ability and the spirit to lift all the voices for freedom. So he became this voice that we could hear everybody's voice around. But it was really made up of many, many leaders. Is that correct, Tom? What would you kind of break that down? I think that's, that's, a, that's just a wonderful image and a great way to think of it. And I, and I think, Curry, more broadly, if we're thinking about what can the civil rights movement teach us about the Constitution and how the Constitution's meaning is shaped over time, what it shows us is that, that, that sometimes it takes multiple strategies, multiple ways of pushing for constitutional change to really get America to live up to its founding ideals. And so with the NAACP, you see figures like Thurgood Marshall pushing for um, you know, the overturning of Plessy v. Ferguson and for eventually Brown versus Board of Education attacking Jim Crow. But within groups like the uh, Southern Leadership Conference, the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference, et cetera, you see pushes outside the courts to get, to get people to enforce the laws, to get people to see the injustices of Jim Crow throughout the South. And so it takes both an inside the courts and outside the courts. And we also see constitutional amendments passed during this period. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of an all hands on deck strategy requiring many different voices, many national leaders, but many people in the grassroots with courage pushing for change at the ground level. And some names we'll never know that have done amazing work. Like there are many, many names that have been lost to history. So real quick, Congress on Racial Equality, kind of who, the, who these people are, who they are, um, Farmer. I mean, amazing names when, and when you dive into this. And students, we're giving you all these names. You can dive into new people and find out more about them too. So pick one that you don't know. Yeah, and so this, this, this organization founded in 1942, another one of these organi organizations really pushing for nonviolent direct action. They're very active in organizing the Freedom Rides in 1961, which we'll talk about later. And James Farmer, in, in many ways, the, 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 you know, one of the, the founding forces of this organization. We'll see Methodist minister George Hauser there and Bernice Fisher, who ends up being one of the main advocates for um, sit-ins, for the sit-in strategy, which we'll talk about later as well. And then the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Of course, the Leadership Conference is founded in 1950, and it's, it's the part of the, of the civil rights movement really involved in pushing for Congress to take action, for passing for, to pushing for legislation. So they're the main organizing group for the civil rights movement, pushing for eventually the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and they remain really playing that role to this very day, a really central, central part of the civil rights movement. And then some of my favorites are always in here, the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. Um, so this is, yeah, what oh, they, I'm what's sorry. What's the nickname? I just wanted to, because I think students probably have heard the nickname before. But SNCC. SNCC, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, yeah, no, so this is that next wave, this, that next generation of young leadership in the civil rights movement founded in, in the 1960s, really active in the student sit-in movement in Greensboro and North Carolina, and then spreading all throughout 
uh, major cities throughout the United States. And so here we see the most famous figure being the late John Lewis, who was involved, I mean, when you read his biography, involved in basically every major action here from the 60s onward, from the sit-ins to the Freedom Rides to the March on Washington. But you see other key figures here, Diane Nash, who is central to organizing the sit-ins in Nashville, is central to the Selma campaign for voting rights. You see Ella Baker again, who was active with Dr. King in the SLCC, now being a pioneer of the, of the student nonviolent coordinated committee. These are all mouthfuls, uh, which is why we usually go with the acronyms. But Ella Baker really saying that, you know, this next wave of leadership, you need to both do direct action. You need to keep doing nonviolent direct action, but don't forget the vote. We need to keep fighting for the vote. And then I could go on and on, you know, Julian Bond ends up founding the Southern Poverty Law Center in 1971. Soakley Carmichael is a key figure of the Black Power Movement. Bob Moses is a key figure in Mississippi pushing for voting rights. Bernice Johnson Reagan ends up being a, a major figure teaching about the importance of music, of song, to unify people throughout the civil rights movement of all races towards the powerful vision of freedom and equality that all of these folks are, are, are pushing for. So Tom, I know we have to bring our kids up to 1950 and it's a real quick time walk that we're gonna do because they have lots of questions about what was going on in the 1940s and 50s leading up to um, you know, MLK's death and other pieces. So you know, give us our foundation. We start, you know, our country begins with this, this promise that all men are created equal and then kind of walk us through. And I wanna just hit really talk about where we're one and where we're two a little bit and how we tell the world what we believe in again after the declaration. Absolutely, so I mean, one thing that's, that, that I think is important to remember and that the civil rights movement teaches us again is that when you're pushing for constitutional change in America, you, you, the, 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 the most prominent argument, the most natural argument people usually make is rooting those arguments in our founding documents, saying that America, you have these great founding ideals, you are not living up to them, live up to them. And we see this, for key figures throughout the fight for civil rights throughout American history. So what are these key documents? Curry already said the Declaration, the most famous, all men and eventually all women are created equal, natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we also get into the Constitution and we see the, the, the powerful language of the preamble saying we, the people, the argument is so often that we African-Americans, we are also the people from the very beginning to the end. And we, lay, we need to lay claim to the most important rights that are enshrined in our constitution. But also within the constitution we see, of course, after the Civil War, we ratify a series of amendments that advance the cause of freedom and equality. The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, the 14th Amendment overturning Dred Scott and writing the Declaration of Independence as promise of freedom and equality into the constitution. The 15th Amendment banning racial discrimination and voting. And so, you know, whether you're Frederick Douglass during Reconstruction, whether you're Dr. King during the Civil Rights Movement, so many of the arguments you're making are holding up your Constitution and saying, keep faith with this, keep faith with this Constitution and with the promise going back to the Declaration. And what's amazing about this story, Curry, is that for a brief shining moment, we actually did it. We saw an experiment in interracial democracy in America in the late 1860s into the 1870s after the Civil War where we had African-American governors, state legislators, members of Congress, members of the Senate, all the way down to local sheriffs. We, we really attempted this down South and it succeeded for a time, really driven by both actions by the national government, but also the votes of African-Americans yearning, yearning for equal citizenship and the ability to participate through their vote. But of course we know this didn't last long, this didn't last long, Curry, tragically, this period ended all too quickly replaced by what we know as you know, the Jim Crow era in the South. And so what does that mean? What did that concretely mean? So we're getting to the end of the 1800s into the early 20th century. What did Jim Crow mean? Well, I just said, African-Americans were voting. They were voting in very large numbers in the South. Well, through a combination of Jim Crow laws, like literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and violence, African-American voting largely disappears in the South. We also see just a range of laws that enforce the badge of inferiority on African-Americans, make, making them second-class citizens, saying that you can't sit with white people in rail cars, that you can't go to the same, your children can't go to the same schools as white children, that you can't drink from the same water fountain, you can't use the same restroom, et cetera, et cetera. And so we see this combination of laws on the books in the South 
combined with white violence against African Americans enforcing this Jim Crow system of second class citizenship. And tragically, we see the Supreme Court, you know, largely allowing this system to remain in place. It takes a while for the Supreme Court to begin to pick up again on the promise of the 14th Amendment and equality. Instead, we see decisions like Plessy v. Ferguson here saying that separate but equal is okay. Jim Crow is constitutional. Jim Crow doesn't violate the Constitution's 14th Amendment and its promise of equality. And so I'll pause there, Curry, before we get into the next, next part of the, the story. Uh, yeah, I wanted to share what Amber shared in the chat um, with, with the Jim Crow laws. Um, Blacks were not equal even though, even through the laws that were passed, separate but equal, Blacks were given worse condition than whites. And that's, and I, we can talk for like a second about John Marshall Harlan. Um, that's what was set up in Plessy v. Sergan. The Supreme Court said separate but equal is okay. That's what it is. But there was one person that was on the Supreme Court that called the rest of their members out and said, this is not right. Separate but equal, not only did, was it never equal, that's not the point. As soon as you separate things, you create a difference and a negative towards it. And so can you just talk about that for one minute? Because it is written into the, that dissent, even though it's only one person dissenting on the Supreme Court, it is written into that court case. And Thurgood Mar Marshall uses it, what, almost a hundred years later in mm -hmm. his, his kind of like, look, you guys knew this was wrong a hundred years ago. We need to fix it now. Yeah, and remember, Plessy's less than 30 years after the ratification of the 14th Amendment. And already you have the Supreme Court seven to one saying the Jim Crow laws are constitutional. The one is John Marshall Harlan. And he's this extraordinary figure. He himself, he's from Kentucky. He's from a slaveholding family. He opposed Abraham Lincoln. He opposed the Reconstruction Amendments. But he was changed by Reconstruction itself. He was changed by the white violence against African Americans. And in Plessy versus Ferguson, he issues this landmark dissent where he says, everyone knows what Jim Crow is about. It is about attempting to make African Americans inferior. That violates the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. The Constitution, he says, is colorblind. We have no caste here in the United States. And he predicts that Plessy v. Ferguson will become just as infamous a decision as Dred Scott before it. And so it does. And this is a reminder that even just a single dissenting voice on the Supreme Court can ring through the decades and keep the hope alive, a hope of a constitution that's actually advancing the promise of equality. So the students are dying to know kind of like who inspired everybody in the civil rights movement. So I wanna do two things really quickly. I wanna talk about um, Du Bois and World War II and how the soldiers um, in World War I and World War II inspired our entire country with this double victory. And then I wanna dive into like Rosa and MLK and some of the other major leaders and what they did Thurgood Marshall across the country to, to society, change society and change the laws at the same time. Yeah, no, this is, this is I, I'm so glad that, that, that uh, they asked this question because it, it is a theme we see in American history at different times. So we have African-Americans on the battlefield going to fight for America in a segregated army, in a segregated army, but giving their lives for their nation. And so what we see here then is a very simple argument. It's advanced by W.B. Du Bois, among others. But the idea of the double V, the double victory campaign is we're gonna defeat the Nazis abroad and we're gonna defeat racism at home because the core of what we're trying to do in World War II is to advance freedom throughout the world, but we also have to do it here. And so with, with, with the uh, African-American veterans, Curry, what we see are both people who will build the communities necessary to nurture the civil rights movement and become so many key leaders throughout this fight. But as, 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 as unfortunately, what we also see is that many of these African-American veterans also have a target on their back and that they, they would also be the, the, the people who would be prominent members of the community that would sometimes face the most virulent racism, the most violent acts. And, but, but in the end, we see both in World War I and then after World War I with the Cold War with the Soviet Union, a push where what we're doing on the global stage where we're trying to advance freedom influences what people think in the United States and, and makes us take more seriously, look, look more closely in the mirror the degree to which we're not living up to our founding ideals. And you know, the Soviet Union would criticize the United States as we're trying to push against communism. They'd say, before you push with the rest of the world, take care of yourselves first. 
And so Du Bois and civil rights movement and many of their allies are making precisely this argument, America, heal thyself. Great. Okay, so let's do, I'm going to get to all these questions because the students are dying and I'm, I'm getting, weaving them in as we go, gang. But let's do a little beat on Rosa Parks because I, I love Rosa Parks and so many people were, you know, told she got on the bus and she was tired and she didn't want to do it anymore. She didn't want to walk to the back of the bus, so she just sat down. And I feel like that's such a disservice to this amazing human and all that she did before, during, and after. And the students asked, who inspired Rosa Parks? I know I love the story, it's the saddest story, but I, I know that Rosa Parks said to herself before she walked onto that bus that day, knowing exactly what she was going to do, she was scared. And she thought of Emmett Till, and he's a young man that was beaten and killed um, because of walking into a store and being accused of saying hi to a white woman. None of it was true, but still was, he was a young black man in the South and that's why he was killed. And she said, you know, get it together, do it for Emmett and walked onto that bus. Um, so thinking about hard things to do and hard things people have went through. So in that moment, that's who inspired her. But can you tell us a little bit about these two uh, women and how they led the field for decades and decades uh, before the 50s and after the 50s? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the, the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks, the, her famous moment is in 1955, but she's a key figure in the civil rights movement before that. What is it? I think in 1943, she becomes the secretary of the Montgomery branch of the NAACP, and, she's, and she works with Recy Taylor to create this committee, the Committee on Equal Justice. And what are they focusing on there? This is in the 1940s. They're focusing on violence against African-American women. And so Rosa Parks has been a key figure in the civil rights movement before that day that she, that she refuses to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery. Um, and it's part of a strategy, a strategy to expose the, the unjust treatment of African-Americans in the South, focusing especially on some of the cities where we see the most segregation, where we see the most discrimination. And so it's Rosa Parks getting on the bus that day, refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger. She's arrested. And then it galvanizes this amazing moment here in Montgomery, this Montgomery, the, the African-American community in Montgomery, Alabama, boycott the bus system. What does the boycott last for like 380 days? Like it's a really, really long time in public transportation. If you live in Montgomery, Alabama, it's pretty important to your lives. It's, it's very, very, it's not only is it degrading to have to deal with segregation on the bus, but while you're boycotting the bus, there's great personal, uh, it's, it's it, at, at the least inconvenience of having to walk everywhere. Uh, you don't have cars. And so with this, though we see the African-American community galvanized in Montgomery, of course, Montgomery is also where a young, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a young minister takes over, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but we see this as really the, uh, an important early wave of nonviolent direct action taken by African-Americans. That being in the case of Rosa Parks, and we'd see it multiple times over the course of this period, the, the seeing an unjust law, refusing to give into it, being arrested for it, but in that exposing how unjust it is. Awesome, and I, I always like to point out um, Morgan because she sat on a bus in 1940, before 1946 to ensure that interstate buses weren't allowed to be segregated. So again, we're just trying to like show that there's all these moments that lead up to what we think of as just one period of time, but it's tons and tons of action by lots and lots of people. No, that, that's absolutely right, Curry. Should, where, where should we, where do you think we should go next? There's so many things we could talk I about. I know. So let's run through a couple of questions real quick, and then we'll dive <laughs> into kind of the desegregation of the schools. Uh, and then I want to do Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act. Um, so run through the gamut of questions. Um, the person who killed MLK, um, why did he kill him? So real quick, let's just um, go over that one. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I basically for the reason you would expect. I mean, he was a prominent figure in the civil rights movement. Um, and he's, this is part of like a wave of violence we see against national political leaders anyway, including JFK, RFK, up to Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, but you know, it's, 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 it's because of his prominence. And he was in Memphis that day, part of a, a, you know, another protest, another protest that led in some violence and unfortunately led to his tragic death. Um, next question. Um... Who bombed Martin Luther King Jr.'s house? Say, I don't, I 
I don't remember. Do you remember that, Curry? I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah, and I just wanted to confirm with a student. There was a bombing of and that, that killed four little young girls in an African American church that Martin Luther King spoke of many times, and it might be that connection. There was so much violence. Um, there's so much violence that happens during these time periods. And one of our other student questions was, uh, so if there's so much violence going on with World War I and the, and the vets and World War II and the vets, and there's so much resistance and so much pushback, how come it feels like it was ignored until the 1950s and 60s? What, what kind of like, and that's a great question, like what changes? Um, no. Yeah, I know. And I feel like every there's so many scholars that are writing their dissertation on this. So brilliant question from the group. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's such a deep question. I mean, the one thing I'd urge even before giving a response is, you know, one thing to do is go back and read the letter from a Birmingham jail by Dr. King, and he can give you a sense of, you know, the push and pull that the whole movement is feeling during this time where, you know, in the 1940s, but all the way into the 1960s, like there's this sense of there's injustice, but you know, despite all the injustice, despite all the violence, are you guys pushing too hard? Are you, is, is all of this action in fact leading to more violence? Can't you just wait? Um, to which Dr. King's response in his letter from Birmingham jail was, it's easy to say to wait if you're not the person that's being oppressed and waiting alone will not change, uh, you know, change the country. And so we see on the one hand, there is this push and pull all the way into the 1960s. The other is that we see a, a, an early wave in the World War II and then the beginning of the Cold War, where we see some public opinion among what you would call moderate whites shifting as a result of sort of these forces of being, you know, uh, you know trying to attack freedom abroad, but, but seeing inequality at home. But then you would see, and we'll get into them, Curry, this, this, this period of really, really shocking images on television that arise from direct nonviolent action by Dr. King, by John Lewis, by all of these groups we talked about at the beginning, that's, that will shake the conscience of the American, of, of, of much of white America and allow for the possibility of the landmark action that we'd see later. Yeah, and I think one of the things that kind of blew my mind with so many of these protests, and I'll show you some of the images of the protests that, we're that Tom's talking about, that like change public perception because they see the violence on TV. So the freedom rides, these are rides to the South on the buses to not just de desegregate the buses, the lunch counters, but to get people vote to vote, registered and to vote in those communities to change things. But all this violence is begins to be captured because of technology and media changes, but also because the civil rights leadership brings their own camera people. So it wasn't like the major news organizations were always following them. They had to bring their own camera people. And then when something would happen to share the information back out and you can see it. If you, I love deconstruction images, get the big images of the time period and you'll see people holding cameras. You'll see kind of these moments and you'll realize they are civil rights protesters doing that work as well. Um, so a couple more questions just as we go into this time. Mm -hmm we'll jump back into kind of this time period and what we're looking at and, and really hit Brown v. Board of Ed and those major changes. Um, when, we, when we kind of look at um, the violence that is happening and associated during this time period, um, do we see everything targeted just at MLK? And the students were asking, did, was, he, was there attempts on his life before um, he was murdered in 19, 1968, if I get the year correct? Um, it, or is it just violence across the board on all the civil rights leaders as well and all the civil rights members? Well, he received many death threats before his assassination. He was in constant danger. Uh, but no, we see, you know, violence against many, you know, different leaders. You know, Medgar Evers was the leader of the NAACP in Mississippi. He was murdered in what was it, I think, 1963. We already talked about Emmett Till. But I mean, we see not, not just assassinations, but so much of what, what the civil rights movement is doing through you know, direct action and nonviolence is to you know, take something like the Greensboro, North Carolina sit-ins. You know, what are those? Well, there's laws there that say African-Americans can't be at lunch counters. Um, and so they sit at the, the, you know, the, 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 the civil rights protesters would sit at those lunch counters. And what would they be greeted with? Yelling, pulling, hitting, and they wouldn't hit back. They wouldn't hit back, they'd be arrested, they wouldn't hit back. And so, 
in part, what they're attempting to do is to show both the unjustness of the laws itself, but to show themselves to be nonviolent people who are being subjected to violence. Um, and you, so you see that sort of across the board and that helps to shape public opinion. No, no, I mean, from, and frankly, you could go all the way back to like reconstruction all the way to the civil rights era. So the late 1800s, all the way to the 50s, 60s and seven, uh, 50s, 60s and onward, where people who are pushing uh, for racial equality are frequently uh, subject to threats of violence and violence itself. Awesome, and I know we're running out of time and a lot of our students have to jump, but can you talk about Brown versus Board of Ed? Um, and then we'll, we'll roll into maybe the Voting Rights Act um, and wrap up. Sorry. <laughs> sure. Absolutely, Kerry. Yeah, so, so, so what we see, so what are like the big landmark things that we see uh, in, in, you know, during this period? Well, one is Brown versus Board of Education. So this is the famous Supreme Court opinion of 1954. It's the opinion that says you can't have racial segregation in the schools. You can't have separate schools for white children, African-American children. This didn't come out of nowhere. It was the product of a decades long legal campaign led by the NAACP, by Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, William Hasty, chipping away at Jim Crow case by case by case, and then eventually culminating in Brown versus Board of Education. So, I mean, that's, that, that, that's sort of, that's what we see in the legal strategy. But part of the reason we get to the Montgomery boy, bus boycott, the sit-ins, freedom rides and everything else is that Supreme Court opinions themselves don't necessarily change everything or change nearly enough. And so often, and what we see throughout this period is massive resistance to Brown, massive resistance to an attempt to, to get rid of Jim Crow throughout the South. And so that's where we see all of this direct action by the civil rights movement attempting to attack and shape public opinion about Jim Crow laws. And so we see, uh, Curry, if we want to just sort of tick through the timeline, we have the Montgomery bu bus boycott in 55. Um, we have the sit-ins beginning, the student sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960. We see the freedom rides, which we just talked about in 1961, which are civil, uh, are, are people of, of, uh, are, are, of multiple, of, of different races sitting on buses, taking buses interstate down into the South to basically forced the South to desegregate the rail lines as the Supreme Court said that they must and being greeted with their buses being bombed with violence. But again, it's, 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 it, it, it's the searing images of a bus being firebombed by a, a, a mob, a mob that, be, that continue to shape and change public opinion. Um, and then, you know, as we, as we proceed forward from there, Curry, we see James Meredith in 1962 desegregating the University of Mississippi. So really trying to bring racial equality to higher education. Um, and then we get into 1963, which in many ways ends up being, you know, in, in, in certain ways, the most famous year for the civil rights movement. Because one, it includes the, the famous Birmingham, Alabama protests, where we famously see Bull Connor, the police commissioner of Birmingham, releasing violent dogs, fire hoses, cattle prods on the civil rights protesters, these images being blasted into the homes of white America throughout the United States and people being absolutely shocked by it. It's also from this activity where Dr. King is placed in jail in Birmingham, Alabama and writes his famous letter from a, from a Birmingham jail. Um, and then we see this lead all the way up to the famous March on Washington in 1963 which is there, why was it 1963? Well, it's the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's where Dr. King famously says, we African-Americans were given a promissory note to freedom and equality through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We, we, haven't, received, we haven't received the money yet, but we still, we, we still have hope that America can redeem the promise of its founding. Um, and it looks like maybe you wanna jump in, Curry, I'm not sure. No, I'm, I'm answering a question in the chat. Sorry, that oh, okay. was my face. Um, oh, no, 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 I, no, I, I, I just to want to make sure. And, and so, so we have the March on Washington, the famous I Have a Dream speech. It still isn't enough. It's not enough to bring us over the finish line. There's still Southern opposition to um, new civil rights legislation. But in the end, we do see, because of a lot of the actions of the civil rights movement, JFK finally embracing and saying that there's a need for a civil rights bill we see then, we already discussed it, Curry, but we saw the tragic church bombing in Birmingham where four young girls were killed, were murdered in Sunday school. Um, and then we see, tragically, John F. Kennedy himself being assassinated. And so what happens at sort of the end of this? We see 
finally, a, 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 a big enough push in Washington for major civil rights legislation with President Lyndon Johnson being pushed by the civil rights movement that leads to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which lays out, it, I, I urge you, go back to Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, look at the vision of equality he talks about there and compare it to what we get in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's a promise of equality in hotels, in restaurants, in schools, in buses and transportation, in jobs, in government. And what we see is, you know, an, an expansion of, 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 of civil rights as we haven't seen in a hundred years, in a hundred years in America. It's a landmark statute. It's upheld by the Supreme Court in two, deci in, in two decisions, Heart of Atlanta and Katzenbach versus McClung. But then what the civil rights movement says is, this isn't enough. Civil rights aren't enough. We need the vote. We need to push for political rights. And so we see the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee organizing Freedom Summer in Mississippi pushing for registration in, in many ways, the most segregated state, Mississippi, where there's also many African-Americans. It doesn't succeed, it doesn't succeed, but we see the civil rights movement continuing to push, culminating in uh, you know, uh, what's known as Bloody Sunday, the march in Selma, the march from Selma to Montgomery, where you have 600 civil rights protesters pushing for the vote, protesting against the murder of a voting rights activist, being met on the bridge with violence, John, John Lewis was on that bridge. He would, he would uh, uh, have that scar from that day literally on his skin for the rest of his life. But this also, this too, which reshape public opinion in America and lead to and culminate in the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which in many ways is it's such one of the most, one of the landmark statutes, the landmark laws in American history that finally, finally, finally gave the national government, gave the courts, the resources they needed to attack Jim Crow in voting. And we saw a massive expansion of voter registration and voting and office holding from African-Americans, you know, almost immediately, but by a decade later. And this has been like an unbelievably lively class with lots of questions. And I love that gang. I know we kind of walked through this really quickly, but that's why we started with, there's so much here. There's so many people, there's so many amazing moments as as we look at history and history is hard and the civil rights movement is definitely a hard history but there are tom and i were talking about it before class it is it is some amazing moments too it can be the best of us and we look at the the great leadership of mlk of rosa parks but of the many many others like john lewis who you know faced with violence over and over again still fought to make change for all of us to make those major changes in the law and one of the questions from the student was, you know, what was MLK's last speech? And I'm, I'm pretty sure that the American Dream speech was one of his last public speeches um, on July 4th of 1960, or not, it wouldn't have been the last public speech, what major, major, his, one of his major speeches. But were there any kind of last major speeches or moments that we should remember, Tom, as we wrap up class? Well, I think with, with, with Dr. King and the American Dream speech here, and that, yeah, that is, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a landmark speech. It's, but it's, once again, he returns to a similar theme we see throughout in his, in, in, in his speaking, which is, you know, on the one hand, celebrating America's deepest ideals, our founding documents, but on the other hand, calling on us to live up to them. And so he continues that theme with the American Dream speech. But you're right, Curry, you know, it's not as though these debates go away with this Voting Rights Act of 1965. You know, we see great moments, you know, 1968, the Fair Housing Act, is enacted, which attacks discrimination um, you know, in housing throughout the United States. Um, but we also see persistent debates over many of the issues that the civil rights movement were pushing in the 40s, 50s, and 60s debates that reverberate to today. Everything from, you know, have we realized the promise of Brown? How do we ensure desegregated schools and equality for African-American students and white students and all students in America? You know, the question of how, you know, how do we balance um, you know, the, the powers of the national government versus the powers of the states when it comes to voting rights. So we see that in, most recently in a, a Supreme Court case in 2013, Shelby County versus Holder, which had to do with the Voting Rights Act and debates continue over sort of, you know, how much, how big a role the national government has to play to enforce voting rights versus how much of that should be left to the states. You know, if you read many of Dr. King's speeches and many of the other civil rights leaders, there was a concern about African-Americans being treated equally by the police. And so mm -hmm. concerns about police violence and police brutality, those remain debates that we have to this very day. 
Um, and, and you know, I think just yeah, to like just, echo what you were saying is like read the whole speech. And I know it's a lot, but it's beautiful. Um, and read John Lewis's speech on that day as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it some of the things that you see in there are debates that are going on literally in the last week, in the last two weeks. So this is why we want to kind of unpack it and get you excited and make you, you know, dig in more into these pieces. But when we think about the civil rights movement, there are so many facets of this. And when I go back to that Declaration of Independence, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what they're looking for. So freedom to where you can live, freedom to where you go to school, freedom to what job that you're, you can take, all those kind of freedoms wrapped into there. And that pulls us back to the Declaration. And that was a big piece of the evolution of the civil rights movement too, that they started talking about you know, the ability to vote and have power in the government, but it keeps growing. And so it's not just one story the whole time. Um, there's a lot in here, a ton in here and amazing, amazing people and amazing figures. Um, and so we're excited to have you guys dive in deep. We will send you, um, and yes, and a great comments in the chat too. Like, yes, all of those things too. Um, the black power movement, which I think is absolutely fascinating and we need to dig into more but we will send you a brief with lots of links, but share your great ideas too. And we'll share them out with the students. We were doing this on Monday and everybody has great tools. So send them our way and we'll push them back out. Um, any other kind of wrap up moments? Cause we are now 11, 12 minutes over. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, Corey. I think that the last thing I would leave it with is like much like John Lewis, we should all learn from him because what he taught us about and his allies taught him about this is that, you know, to, to really realize the promise of the declaration it often takes some, it takes the courage and it takes faith in the constitution and, 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 and it takes human action. And so that's the, 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 the movement and, uh, and all of those amazing people understood that, understood that deeply. I, and you're right. I think we can never forget that it is the power of the people that moves change. And I love civil rights too. One of our students says, I like civil rights. I'm like, yep, so do I. I love this topic. I love it, fascinating. So thank you so much, Tom. Thank you students, awesome energy today, great questions. And um, for our advanced class, we will see who is ever joining us for both at two o'clock. But if not, we'll see you next time in class. Absolutely, great chat today. Absolutely, <laughs> it was really <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording now.